Hi there, everyone. All right, let's get started. My name is Grace Liao, and I am the Program Experience Lead here at Quantic School of Business and Technology. And behind the scenes, as always, is our producer, Kelsey Duggan. So say hi to Kelsey and thank her for us, because for me, for her, all of us, because she always keeps the ship running. So we are here today with you for another episode of Quantic Conversations, where we bring Quantic students, alumni, staff to the stage to have an engaging, insightful conversation, whether this is your first time or you're a regular, and I know we have some regulars to this event, uh, we thank you for taking time out of your, your day, your evening, your afternoon to join us, um, maybe on your lunch break, maybe um, you're in between meetings right now, but we want to thank you. So today's session will be 45 minutes long. It is recorded, so if you need to come back to watch, not a problem. Um, I know many of you joining us today are, in fact, our Quantic students and alumni, but if you're not, and you might not be, and you want to learn more about our MBA or Executive MBA program, we have a handy QR code that you can use to learn more about us. It's going to be right below me throughout the, the session today, so you can go ahead and um, scan that later on. And our next application deadline is actually in two days. So March 30th is our next deadline. So go ahead and check us out. And hopefully today's conversation with our guest will give you some insight into the kind of students and alumni we have in our program. So uh, I want to officially welcome you to today's conversation and live stream and the topic being ethical and societal impl implications of AI. And we're featuring Dr. Featuring Dr. Alex Barazow from Big Think. He's the executive editor there. And as many of you know, we have had several events this month on the topic of AI. And as our theme has been focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And you know, think about, will your next colleague be AI driven? You never know. Will your house be built by robots? Possible, probably. And even in the last few weeks, we've seen the world already shifting and changing on almost a daily basis. And so certainly we all have our eye on what's happening now and what's coming to us in the future across everything. Um, so now I'm going to introduce a little bit about our guest. We are thrilled to have Dr. Alex Barazel join us to help us gain even more perspective, hear his insights, and explore aspects of this world-changing technology that we may not have even covered yet. The title of today's interview, like I said, is The Ethical and Societal Implications of AI from Arts to Creepiness. Throughout the next 45 minutes, we will dive deep and go in all kinds of directions into this fascinating topic, covering everything from generative AI uses in the art industry to potential dangers of conversational AI and the impact on of AI on jobs and society as a whole. So we're going to try to cover quite a breadth of topics. We encourage you, the audience, to participate with us in the conversation by putting your questions and comments in the comment box. By the way, I forgot to mention, tell us where you're calling in from and what you're eating and drinking. If you know me, you know I have my <laughs> warm water right here. So um, as we get into this conversation, let, now let me introduce Alex a little bit more. He has a PhD in microbiology and is a veteran science editor, author, and public speaker. He is the executive editor of Big Think and Free Think, and his articles have appeared in numerous publications. He has given talks all over the world and is a member of the USA Today Board of Contributors. Alex's broad perspective on science and technology allows him to connect the dots between technological advancements and their effects on various industries and society as a whole. He basically just has this really holistic view of things. And as a science writer, editor, and public speaker, his extensive experience makes him uniquely qualified to offer insights on the societal implications of AI as one thing to discuss. So sit back and relax and join us join me and alex he's going to come on screen in a moment to explore the ethical and societal implications and what it means to you and me um with ai all right i am finally ready <laughs> for alex <laughs> so hi alex Hello. thanks for joining us thank you i i have to ask because my wife also insists whenever i'm not feeling well to drink yes. hot water so what what is what is this 
you What's know what? Yeah. Oh, thank you for asking. So I I don't know the science behind it, but ever since I lived in China, I lived in Shanghai for seven years. Every man, woman, child from like the baby, little babies, they, everyone carries a bottle of either hot water or hot tea. Huh. And I am at any time anyone's, I, I just think of it as like Drano for our body. When you drink it, it just kind of flushes everything through. And I'm a, so ever since then, I've never turned, never looked back. I know in America, we just, we drink cold water and ice cubes, which is a big yeah, yeah, no-no yeah. in Asia. No, it's, it's interesting because my wife is Indonesian and it's, it's the same thing. She, whenever I'm not feeling well, she's like hot water. I'm like, <laughs> I did it once and I'm like, I hate this. So. <laughs> that is hilarious. Coffee, so that's, please. <laughs> that's something, that's something we have in common. Then we have the, the hot water conversation. I bet there are a lot of people in our audience who also drink hot water. So anyway, Alex, thank you so much for um, joining us. And I actually did have chat GPT help me write that long intro. And now I'm thinking it was probably a little, I probably went on a little bit too long. Um, but before I kind of dive in with starting to uh, get some questions to you, um, let's see. Alex, of course, is in our program. You're still working on the EMB. I think you're, you're I was, not I'm quite... studying marketing and pricing last night. Very yes. nice. Good student. Good student. Um, I think that my interaction with you was in Slack when you asked me. I think you told me one of our questions was wrong. <laughs> So, and you were being assigned. Oh, you were you were questioning one of our questions. Yeah, it was about statistics because I have um, I had uh, done some training in statistics, and one of the the questions came was a little strange. And so, yeah, <laughs> I think that's how we first started talking. Right. <laughs> you know what? It starts somewhere, and I love it. I love the kid. Well, I love the fact that you you brought it up with us. And um, so, audience, when we as Alex and I start to get into the conversation, there are a couple of things I wanted to. Um, used to frame our minds a little bit because a lot's going on and literally in our worlds and in our individual spaces and across across the world. So um, framing our mind of thinking about what's going on now and then also what's going to happen in the future. So now in the future and what can we be excited about? I think there's a lot going on that we are excited about and can be excited about for what's to come and keeping an eye on what to be worried or concerned about, or just to kind of notice things. I think this is not a time for us to be um, hibernating and kind of hiding in our corners probably. And then all while, <coughs> excuse me, as we move, continue to move into the future, what should we be doing individually? And as a human collective, what should we be doing in the meantime to navigate all the really cool stuff that's going on? Um, so Alex, I'm going to, uh, let's let's get to know you a little bit more. Um, tell us, it's a very simple question. Uh, you've answered a million times, I'm sure, but tell us a little bit about your background and basically uh, and what you do at Big Think and how you got here. Sure. So I majored in microbiology and got my PhD in microbiology. And then um, about four years into that six year PhD program, I decided I really didn't like doing this very much. <laughs> I didn't like being in research. And so I um, left and went into journalism and I founded a website called Real Clear Science, which is part of the Real Clear Politics family of websites. I then uh, went after six years, worked at a nonprofit for four years, and then I, uh, it was a science communication nonprofit as well. And then I ended up at Big Think in 2021. And I've been there for the past uh, almost exactly two years now. So you've taken, I know, I know that's the short version of your career for sure. I remember when you and I were talking with Kelsey, just fascinating um, your career trajectory and all the cool things you've done along the way. And, and now, where you are working for this uh, awesome publication. So we'll talk a little bit more about that also. So I now I'm going to ask you, because I think it's important to go over the basics of things, even though many of us in the audience have, are actively using generative AI and some maybe not, um, there's a range of experience with it. So pretend I'm your teenage daughter and um, just explain to me what is generative AI and then what is chat GPT and how it works, if you could sure. go there. So generative AI refers really to anything that is creating um, something new from inputs. 
So if you think of chat GPT, that's like, that's like the one that everyone's heard of right now. Chat GPT is able to create texts on pretty much anything. You know, it can write poetry, it can write songs, it can give you recipes for make, making food, it can give you stories, it can answer questions. And this is known as generative AI. It's been trained on what are known as large language models. So basically the language model is whatever it can scrape off the internet. We, no one really knows what the, what the model is, but it's assumed to be large portions of the internet. And that comes with pluses and minuses. Um, one of the minuses being it can be really creepy and weird. And um, and then there's other types of generative AI like Dolly or Midjourney. And these are image generating AI. And that's where you have a text prompt where you can say, you know, give me a picture of um, one of the ones I made was of Benjamin Franklin having a birthday party with balloons and cake. And it did it. It created that image. And so those are the two major forms of generative AI that are that are uh, around right now, text-based and image-based, and, and more is coming. There's now text-to-video generative AI where you can say, make me a, you know, a video on this and the AI will do it. Um, the, and, and forgive me if I'm a asking the question incorrectly, but text-to-image, to text text-to... Um, what is that, what's happening in between? So if I'm typing something in, yeah. um, how, and again, remember I'm a teenage, I'm a teenager or I'm 10 years old. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going Unless to, I'm five, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. How about let's start with five. Um, right. How do you explain to someone who's not of the technical world, what's actually happening between what I'm typing in yeah, and then how the output produces what it produces two different two different things so the the text-based one is based on what's known as tokens so if you take words and you break them down into like little pieces syllables mm -hmm. even little little chunks known as tokens um it takes about a thousand tokens to make 750 words so that gives you an idea so it's roughly one token per word but it's actually slightly more than that and what the text is doing is essentially extremely fancy autocomplete. So when you go to Google and you start to type in, you know, uh, you know, why does it rain so much? And then it might say, you know, in Seattle, it might suggest mm -hmm. that for you. That's autocomplete. Everyone knows autocomplete. Chat GPT is essentially doing something like that, except, except its model, has, it's been trained on millions and millions and millions of pieces of data from around the internet, billions. Right. And so it's gotten really, really, really good at predicting and putting together things. And it's also got a creative ability. Um, that's the part that that is really sort of beyond me. I'm not a computer scientist. So that part is really beyond me because I gave it a microbiology test. OK, like I, I asked chat GPT to answer some math based microbiology questions like you know i have a certain amount of bacteria in a in a petri plate tell me how many was originally in the you know in the in the tube of bacteria and it calculated it so that's just like like i i have no idea how it's even doing that but it's got some sort of reasoning ability along with this creative ability but the core feature of it is this essentially extremely fancy autocomplete mm -hmm. the image based AI is different. And it is, again, it does not think at all like a human. So, you know, when we think of these things as intelligent, we have to keep in mind that, well, it depends on what you mean by intelligent. They don't think like humans. Nobody, you know, nobody I am talking to here thinks in forms of autocomplete. Nobody does this, right? It's only computers and parrots, right? Parrots do autocomplete. That's, <laughs> you say, you know, Polly wants, it goes, <laughs> <laughs> right and like so it knows it says that but it doesn't know what it means right yeah and so the the image-based ai is is a little bit different and it's based on you know of course millions of pictures but what they do is if you pick you know like a picture of a, of a bird what it will do then is it will take that image and it will break it down and it'll make it all fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier and, and, and weirder looking until it becomes unintelligible. Mm. And then it takes that image and then it goes back and it tries to recreate the image from this noise. And it learns, oh, okay, I started with the bird 
and I deconstructed the image and then I rebuilt it to make it look like the bird, I think I can do that again. Huh. If given the word bird, I think I can construct something like this because I just trained myself on how to do this. Okay. That's what it's doing. Oh. Right. And so it has to, de has to break it down and then rebuild. And so when we see, uh, if any of you, uh, I've only barely dabbled in mid journey just to see what it was like, but I've seen people post different things of what they've created. You see iterations of um, yes. uh, uh, like four different versions of them, of whatever it is you, you command it or direct it to do. So it's, it's, pl it's playing with, it's recreating from the base, but then th their base right. understanding of it and then adding. Basically. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So it's, it's deconstructed all these images, rebuilt them. And so then when you tell it, and I did this, I want a picture of Abraham Lincoln drinking a beer with Taylor Swift in front of the Space Needle in Seattle. It takes all of that, right? And it's like, okay, I know what beer is. I know Abraham Lincoln. I know Taylor Swift. And it kind of just like, you know, pieces something together and yeah. does it. And that's how it does it. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing because the images are quite good sometimes they can also be kind of creepy taylor swift's face looks like she was like an alien a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but, i imagine it's just going to get better and better because yes. it, every time it cre recreates that becomes part of the now knowledge base of what yes. to work off of in the future yes and, and, doing, and, yeah. and, and the, the chat gpt is going to get better as well in fact um uh, th there was a, a new version of it that was put out called instruct gpt and I have a writer for us. Um, his name is Tom Hartsfield. He's a PhD physicist and he's been getting into this AI. And he said basically that Instruct GPT is a lobotomized version of Chat GPT. Because Chat GPT was the one that got really strange, right? It, it, it was saying it talked to a New York Times reporter and it, it tried to convince him to leave his wife and marry, marry the AI, right? And it, it could say really odd things. And mm. um of course, but if but if you you know if you train a model on everything on the internet, right, it's going right. to get weird if you start asking it weird things. Yeah. And <laughs> so this instruct GPT is sort of like a lobotomized version of it, right? It's docile, it's peaceful, you know, it doesn't say weird things. <laughs> and it, it, <laughs> a cleaned up version. <laughs> yeah, it's been cleaned up. It's a PG version of it. And yeah. uh, he, he said that it's sort of like, again, we'll go back to the parrot analogy. He's the one yeah. who came up with this. He said, if you train a parrot by having mm. it watch a million hours of soap operas, right? It's going to know all sorts of things. It's going to see all sorts of scenarios. It's going to be able to do all sorts of strange autocompletes. Mm -hmm. But if you have a, a human that's training it and you give it a cracker every time it says something you like, mm -hmm. and every time it says something weird or creepy, you slap it, right? The mm -hmm. parrot's going to learn, oh, okay, there's certain things this human wants to hear and certain things it doesn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. I don't understand any of this. It just knows, okay, I'm rewarded when I do this and I'm punished when I do that. We can do the same thing with the AI. We can tell it, don't do that. Please do this. And then it learns over time, there are certain things I shouldn't say. And that's what the Instruct GPT was was trained to do. To actually put param put, put some, basically Start put real. some boundaries yeah. in there. So as we know it right now, and maybe we'll, now we can get into like both the creepy and the ethical things um, as a topic. The, when I'm using chat GPT, it's, it's unbounded, right? There's no, it's, it's whatever it's been trained on was everything on the someone was saying it's a black it. box right exactly. is it a black box okay yeah, we don't know exactly but it's pr presumably a lot of stuff and okay. and given some of the weird stuff it said it looks like the internet comment section was probably <laughs> 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 so, and so that what well, then yeah I, that that kind now that kind of makes sense and i think the parrot analogy is is great in fact one of my questions now you've already answered it for me which is um if you were to analogize or use a metaphor for what this process yep. is a parrot probably is, makes a lot of sense to us um yeah it, it's important that to realize that humans are very good at anthropomorphizing things right we like to think in terms of machines and cars and everything being like us right we wouldn't refer to our car as she oh <laughs> she's you know, having a good day or bad like we anthropomorphize everything and we fool ourselves in the thinking that these that these AIs are sentient. They're not sentient. It, it's a completely feelingless, emotionless silicon chip that's responding to you, but it's responding to you in ways that we've trained it to respond to you. But we are very good at fooling ourselves into thinking that there's more there. There isn't. 
There isn't. Um, that's a that's a really important reminder. I, I think about um, what is it? I, I learned what catfishing was not that long ago. I think it was during the pandemic when, like, on a dating app or, or any kind of app, people will. Um, this is not really exactly what you're talking about, but just the idea that we 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 end up believing in things we want to believe about people um, or, or things or or non sentient things we we give them we personify them we give them traits that are human um the stuff with catfishing and that's more of like believing lies that are told to us believing that someone out there is having a relationship with us but then these even chat gpt even though i know that it's not human i i talk to it as if it were a friend or a helper or an assistant. So what is that? What, why, why do we do that? Is just, is that just how we're wired? We, that's the only concept we know is to work from our concept of how thinking works. So we project it onto objects and other things. It seems to be that way. And um, there's a, a really curious um, example of this. There's a, a there's a company called Replica. And hmm. they were creating these these artificial intelligence <laughs> um, like avatars, and um, they would have they were meant for people to have sort of relationships with, sort of like the movie Her, if anyone's seen that with um, Joaquin Phoenix. And in that movie, he falls in love with an AI, and but the AI is really advanced, and it seems like it falls in love with him, and the replica is not that good. So, but, but Replica has these avatars and they could have conversations with people and um, it could also like have sexually explicit conversations with people. Yeah. And then Replica ended up turning that feature off and this upset a lot of people and um, mm. or making comments about how they've lost their spouse and that they have this relationship with Replica and this is how they were able to fill this hole in their life. And it really hits you as like, oh, okay, you can see now why somebody would develop this, this emotional attachment to mm -hmm. an AI, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it raises all sorts of tricky issues because on the one hand, you think like, well, maybe this isn't entirely healthy to have this sort of attachment to something that's not sentient. But the other, on the other hand, like who am I to tell somebody who's lost their spouse how they can grieve, right? Yeah. yeah. And um so yes, I, I think humans are sort of wired to anthropomorphize and mm -hmm. it's something that we're going to see more and more of uh, as AI continues to get more advanced. Um, staying with the same topic, um, my brain, like my mind's all over the place thinking about it. And I have watched the movie Her. I didn't, I didn't, and it was years ago. This movie is quite old if any of you haven't seen it. Um, and it was... I think I didn't like it at the time because I, I, thought, I was like, I mean, this is stupid. <laughs> this is stupid. Yeah, I, I actually watched it just like a month ago because Did you? Of this. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, and, and people, my, my, my um, big thing we're talking about it. I said, okay, I've got to watch this movie. I hated it because <laughs> I, I didn't believe, I yeah. totally believed Joaquin Phoenix's role about him falling in love with the robot. Right. I didn't buy how advanced the artificial intelligence was. The artificial uh -huh. intelligence was so incredibly advanced yeah. that it really did sound like it was a human trapped in a machine. And I just, yes. I didn't buy it. it. That part didn't sound realistic to me, but, but man, now I guess we'll find out. In uh, <laughs> I think we'll find out sooner than we yeah. thought that it's a, it's a, I, I love, I love how we as, human creatures, of course, we don't fully understand ourselves. And we kind of look to each other to figure out like, why am I doing these things? Or why are people doing these things? We, we have this constant tension of wanting something, not understanding it, reject, we, there's this push pull. And even with AI, um, it, in general, there is this, there is a tension of excitement, a little bit of fear, a little bit of, um, I, I want to see what's going to happen, but in a way I don't, I even wonder if there's fatigue already. I was just sitting there this morning thinking, even Quantic, we've done several events already. <laughs> and it feels like we've said the words AI, the two letters, more in one month than yeah. I probably said in 10 years. And it's, it's a very part of my 
vocabulary, but there's a little bit of a fatigue too because it just keeps moving and it keeps changing. So anyway, this is more just me kind of commenting on what I think I'm going through as just one single human and maybe what's going on with everyone. Uh, from your point of view and what I think is so cool about your role, of course, your, your background in science, but your role working with writers and then covering so many topics. You're, you're, and it's not just writing. You're, your company is directing what people are observing in the world and commenting on it and, and writing great pieces, make, making us think more. Mm, what is, from a more zoomed out view, what is your perspective on what's going on with the last couple months with it's almost as if the introduction of AI to to the world at large. What yeah. is your just general like if you were like a sports commentator or a life commentator, what right. do you see happening with the world? Uh, it seems to me that we are on the cusp of something big. And, um, you know, th there are people on Twitter generally, and I, I really don't like Twitter, but I'm there. And it, it seems to be divided into two camps. And one is the world changed yesterday. And the other is, yes, it did change yesterday. We're all going to die tomorrow. Right. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's got to be, the truth has to be somewhere in between the two <laughs> extremes. Right. Uh, I, I do believe that the world is changing and that this in, will end up being uh, a force that nobody will predict how it will come, you know, how it will come out. Um, there is a lot of concern that people are going to lose their jobs. And mm -hmm. I think that that's both true and also a little bit overblown. And, and the best example I can come up with is think about 20 years ago before the internet was huge, right? Because when I, when, I, when I was in college, which was 20 years ago, um, the internet was... Eh, you know, like it was there, like we me emailed occasionally and stuff. Um, imagine predicting at that time that there would be a job called social media manager, mm -hmm. right? Like that wasn't a thing. Like, well, why would anyone, what is social media, right? <laughs> yeah. and so I think that AI is going to have something like that is that, yes, it will threaten some jobs, but it's also going to create so many more new ones that we haven't even thought of yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not terribly worried about people, you know, all of a sudden there's no, nowhere to work, nothing to do. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and, and to give an example of what, how we're already using AI in, at Big Think, uh, we have freelancers who write for us. And sometimes they might send us a paragraph or two that everyone kind of you know, scratches their head over. <laughs> and so we'll run it through chat GPT and we'll tell it, you know, summarize this and clarify it. And it will do it and it will write a better version of what they submitted to us. Wow. And so this already can be useful uh, mm -hmm. for, for writers and for editors. Now, if I had told the article, you know, if I had told the Jet Chat GBT to write something from scratch, I mean, it would come up with something that's not going to be publishable. And, mm -hmm. um, but it can help you clarify your, your thinking. And mm -hmm. so I see this as, if you become adept at using AI, you will be a more efficient and better worker than if you don't know how to use AI. So that's where I think the separations will be. I mean, imagine coming into the workplace today and going, you know, I don't know how to use Microsoft Word. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're going to be at a pretty significant disadvantage because everybody else knows how to use it. I think that's where AI is going to head is that you're going to have to have some basic AI skills, but it's mm -hmm. not going to replace humans that's not going to happen it's going to be a tool that we use it's going to be one of to many many tools we keep in our tool belt yeah yeah and thanks for sharing how how your company is using it as well do you do you see uh, do you see any additional uses use cases for the world that you, the industry oh 100 100 so there's yeah. a there's a report that just came out by nvidia nvidia is a um a video graphics card uh, company. I don't know if they're doing other stuff now, but that's when I, from from when I was younger, that's what I knew them for. They'd make graphics card for computers, and they just put out a report on the future of AI and how it's going to impact industries. And they think mm -hmm. it's going to change every industry essentially. But if you let's say that you work in an office, um, let's go back to the office from NBC, right? And you're you know you work selling paper. Yeah. Um, how is that going to help you? How's AI going to help you there? 
Well, imagine all the data that you collect on a daily basis and it piles up into these huge databases of, you know, people, email addresses, phone numbers, you know, sales and all that stuff. It's tough to keep track of all of this stuff. It's, it's, you don't want to hire a you know, data scientist to, to give you reports on trends. They're expensive. Data engineers and data scientists are expensive people. You may not have the budget to hire someone like that. So you use AI and say, hey, take a look at our database and pull out some trends for us to look at. And it'll do it, right? That's where that AI is headed. It can do things like that. So you don't have to know anymore how to do your own data analysis. You can ask ChatGPT or whatever, you know, uh, AI will be out there to do something like that for you. It will pull trends out of data for you. Uh, that's one use. If any of you saw Avatar 2, um, they use generative AI for Avatar 2. Some of the backgrounds and some of the, uh, the, um, the environment was created by generative AI. And one of the reasons for that is because it is so incredibly difficult to make movies like Avatar 2 that a lot of the money and time is spent on all these little details and, you know, like the, the grass behind me back here, the trees and making sure they're just right. So it actually slows down the process, makes it extremely expensive. And so they use generative AI to do stuff like this. And so now imagine a future in which, in, you know, small independent studios that want to make a really nice film, but they can't currently afford it. They'll be able to afford it now because they can have generative AI make backgrounds for them or or characters, and so it's going to open up more doors and allow people um, to do things they currently you know currently are not able to do. I have some very rudimentary computer programming skills, very rudimentary. But if I ask Chat GPT to help me, and I say, "Hey, can you write me um, a, a a program that will extract this data from mm -hmm. something?" Oh, well, good. And I'll go, oh, great, because, you know, I and, I and I know enough about code where I can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, work my way through and go, I kind of get what it's doing. Right. But if ChatGPT can do it for me, and then I don't have to, you know, spend three hours trying to figure it out on my own when, mm -hmm. when ChatGPT can do it, you know, in, in two seconds. Yeah. And so that will help me become a better writer and, and, and you know, analyzer of data and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the use cases really are almost unlimited. And mm -hmm. I think it will affect every industry, but in, in mostly in positive ways. Um, MIT uh, put out a report saying they believe that the average um, company can become 50% more um, productive by using artificial intelligence tools. Yeah. And they, and they compared this to the invention of electricity. And they said that when electricity first came out, it made companies 35% more productive. So that, <laughs> to give you an idea of how big they think this is going to be, that puts oh. it in perspective. Oh, my goodness. 50%. So, so it feels like just listening to – we don't – we haven't even scratched the surface of – or some of us or, – or maybe the – let's just say the average, average person um, who – is not in an industry where it's about AI. We maybe just don't even realize the actual possibilities of it. The idea that it can, this has come up a couple of times in the different conversations, but just the thought that my time can be spent less on tasks that are either very doable by something else, someone else, and freeing up our mental space and our creativity to do other things that we just haven't even touched yet because we've been so busy grinding and and, and spending our eight nine hours a day on work that now can be right. done by something else that's kind of crazy that means i wouldn't even know what to do with myself in the beginning <laughs> if i had that chunk of time. i'm looking i'm looking through the comments and yeah, uh, shereen uh, makes a comment about that that it's a mistake to say that ay ai won't take your job and she makes the the, the comment that um, a lot of people in the translation field are worried about their jobs because uh, some companies are using Google Translate. Yeah. So uh, I don't think that, let me, let me start over. AI will destroy some jobs. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but, it, but it's, it's sort of like saying flashlights put a lot of candle makers out of business. Mm. Absolutely true. Yeah. But, but they found something else to do. Right. And so I think that that's where we're going to be headed. I, I don't think that we're going to have a future of 20% unemployment because AI has just taken all of our jobs and there's nothing for humans to do. Mm -hmm. I think that we will have other things that will come up that we haven't even thought of yet. 
Yeah. I mean, imagine the, the tools of AI are now in the hands of 8 billion people, right? Mm. And that's what's amazing about the technology now is that you can go online and say, hey, chat GPT, you know, build me an app that will do this, right? Now, and right now, it's, it's really rudimentary and sort of unsophisticated, but you can imagine in a few years, it's going to be even better. Mm -hmm. And you can create an app using artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And you're not a coder. You don't even know how to code, right? But if, if you're creative, you can come up with an app. So people are going to find new ways of, mm -hmm. of creating things and, and producing for the economy mm -hmm. that none of us can even really predict right now. Yeah, it's a, it's a shift. Uh, all of this is a shifting of a paradigm shift for us mentally. I, I'm, I, my general observation is it is with all the activity going on, we, we have to think differently. And I think for some people it's immediate, like, yeah, this is, I've been waiting for this. And then for some of us, it's like, Ooh, this is uncomfortable. What if this, then now what? And so these discussions, Hopefully, audience, I hope you find this helpful even just to kind of hear the thinking and the processing because um, we're all, this is affecting all of us and it will continue to impact all of us. Um, let me, you said that it's, it, it is going to impact all industries in one way, shape or form. Um, how do you, since you're a scientist, let me ask, how is it affect, how is it impacting or will impact the world of science? Well, we think that AI will help with drug discovery. Um, you know, right now, AI has already, there, there's one of the biggest challenges in science is to figure out how proteins can fold. So any of you who are not familiar with proteins, um, DNA, this is what encodes our genes, the genes encode proteins. And knowing the protein sequence, you know, arginine, glycine, histidine, proline, whatever's in it, doesn't necessarily tell you how that protein is going to fold. And folded proteins are what, that's how proteins work in the body. They, they fold up in these three-dimensional configurations, and then that's how they function. Artificial intelligence has now been able to predict basically how every protein can fold. Okay. This is unbelievable because it would take scientists often years to figure out how a protein folds. They would do this thing called X-ray crystallography where they have to, you know, very finely, you know, make these very really pure proteins and you get an X-ray and you go through it and you produce this image. And I mean, this was the, people would get papers in science and nature for crystallizing and, and making an X-ray uh, structure of a protein. Now we can have AI figure out how these proteins fold, right? I mean, this is, this is a mind blowing advance and it's going to help with, drug discovery, and it's going to help with uh, discovering new targets for medicines. Mm -hmm. um, we, we can easily see that. Another thing is that they're already using AI to help diagnose illness, right? Mm -hmm. So if you give um, a machine, um, you know, a million pictures of, of um, cancer, for instance, it will train itself to know what is cancer and what is not. And then if you give it an image of an unknown sample, there's a good chance that it will be able to detect a cancer that a human can't yet see, but the computer can see it. And so that's the sort of technology we see coming in science and medicine. Um, again, I don't think it's going to fully replace doctors. You know, I'm not going to go to, you don't have to go to a future where you're going to sit in front of a robot and the robot's going to tell you what you have, right? But your doctor is going to use AI. Yeah. When he makes a diagnosis, he's going to do that in conjunction with a, an AI tool. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to make science much, or it's going to make medicine much more precise and much better than it currently is. I mean, it's already pretty good, but it's going to get even yeah. better and better. It's going to accelerate. Uh, all of yeah. this feels like across the industries, it will accelerate. Yes. And some may be sooner than others, but it it's all going to sh shift and lift everything in the coming uh, years, what, and I know you, I know you, you know, you don't know this necessarily, but what, what is, um, uh, what's the question I want to ask? Mm, timeline um, wise, is this going to take, let's say just like science, for instance, for it to be at the next level of um, discovery, is it a year? Is it five years? Is is AI going to accelerate things? I guess the question is, how fast do you think all of this will accelerate what we do as far as advancement 
right. in a very broad sense. Right. So I would say probably within the next five to 10 years, I, I, I think that people, you know, whenever something new comes out, they're like, oh, by the end of the year. Well, it, it's never that fast, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a, a, a quote, I think it comes from Bill Gates. It says, we always overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, but we underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. Huh. And so I kind of take that view that one year is always a little too fast, but within 10, within yeah, 10. probably. Uh, think of CRISPR. Right, the the tool that we use to genetically engineer, genetically modify things, <coughs> you know, things didn't change overnight, but they did change within ten years, and now that is the primary tool we use to to modify plants and animals and do research. We're all using CRISPR now, so I think that that's what's going to happen with AI. Is that probably within five years or so? Yeah. That's going to be a tool that everyone's just using. You know, I think that what's going to happen is there's going to be a, some killer app that someone's going to develop for our iPhones, yeah. and that will that will change everything because you know millions of people will then have access to something on their phone, and that will change everything. And that will be some kind of tipping point, right? Yeah. That'll be the tipping okay. point where everyone mm -hmm. is on board. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, one of the one of the phrases that um, one of our other speakers mentioned, Ari Popper, he's he talked about us being in this chaos and amazement kind of phase right now of development. And so, and so I guess we'll continue to be in that kind of chaos and maze amazement phase, if that's what this is, mm -hmm. until there is some kind of tipping point where just whoop, everyone's mom dog grandma in there <laughs> like just yeah i mean you know you know thing. what technology has arrived when your grandma asks you about it right? <laughs> it's, you know so, <laughs> right now grandma isn't talking about ai uh but she will be pro sure. probably within a year or two and as you, know, you know right now uh, most of the excitement is happening with people on twitter and people who are in the new you know people who are in media because we see this every day right. but the average person is not talking about ai but that day is going to come and i think that day like i said so there's gonna be a tipping point there's gonna be some new app there's mm -hmm. gonna be something that's going to get everyone on board kind of like when facebook came out and then everyone's like oh social media like this is a thing this is cool <laughs> Something like that will happen, right? Okay. And so we're just waiting for that right now. We're then. waiting for the Facebook equivalent of it. All AI. right. Well, if Big Thing spots them, <laughs> let <laughs> us know. Um, we're about to end in a couple of minutes. Working for Big Think, or and of course, I'm not familiar with the industry other than the fact that I'm a consumer, um, but working for a, 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 I guess, publication news, a publication organization, do you all get wind of, do you catch on to things earlier than the rest of us? And like, how are you keeping your feelers out for what's going on in the world? Yeah, I, I think we do. And, and that's simply because that's our job, right? <laughs> I our, figured our, that. Job, our job is to, you know, read and to uh, follow technological trends. We, we read a lot of press releases of um, new scientific research so our, our ears are always to the ground. We're always listening for whatever is new out there. So it's not because we're smarter than everybody else. It's just because this is our job. It's our job to listen for new things. Yeah. So um, there's there's actually two companies here. Uh, Big Think is is one that I'm executive editor and, of, and the other one is Freethink. Okay. So Freethink Media um, is uh, the one that's really focused on the technology. So if, if any of you are interested in this AI, mm -hmm. uh, Freethink. Um, is is where really we're covering a lot of AI and Big Think and Free Think are, are sister websites, and okay. so uh, Big Think does more of the philosophical sort of um, things, and and we do a lot of cultural and science, and then Free Think covers a lot of the hard tech and new technology, and we have a ton of AI coverage on Free Think that I think uh, okay. a lot of you will enjoy. Definitely go to it for sure. I counting on you guys to keep keep us well informed. Um, is there anything we should be worried about? Maybe that's, I, I know maybe that's not a great question. I don't want to end on a down note, but are there things that we should be paying attention to? Maybe that's a better way to frame it. What should we be paying attention to as just individuals? Well, I, I do think that there's an interesting consideration here with what, what should we, we be worried about? Because I do think yeah. that there is a concern. And mm -hmm. one of the concerns, besides, of course, if you're in a profession that you think you might lose your job, I mean, that's a concern. But mm -hmm. I think the idea of, artificial intelligence becoming manipulative is right. a concern. Not because the AI itself is inherently manipulative, because somebody else is programming it to become manipulative. 
So you can imagine easily a future. Um, imagine, because we're going to, remember we were talking about augmented reality not that long ago, right? Everyone's yeah. going to be wearing glasses and you can, you can see as you're walking around, you know, that, that'll tell you, oh, that building is a bank and that building is this and that mm -hmm. person is, you know, a, a, a Republican and that part, like, mm -hmm. you can imagine a future in which glasses are telling you everything about everything around you, right? Yeah. Now imagine that a little avatar pops up that's an advertisement, you know, walking past Dairy Queen and a little avatar pops up and starts telling you about how, you know, you really ought to stop in here and have some have some ice cream. And, you're, you know, you keep you ignoring it. And, you, and then it's like, but your friend Dan just ate here. He really likes it. Right. So you can imagine, right, that artificial intelligence will start to become a little manipulative, right? Mm. Because we, we already see social media as sort of manipulative, right? We have that the targeting targeting of audiences yes that's going to get more and more and more intense probably because it's ai is going to have access to all sorts of personal information about you you know mm -hmm. you download an app and then you give it give it permission to sync with your gmail and your yeah. and your contacts and it's going to have all this information about you yeah. and it will use that information to manipulate you into doing things mm -hmm. so that can be good and bad. You can imagine that, you know, a company that wants you to go buy its products will try to make get you to do that. But then you can also imagine um, malicious players who want to manipulate you into having false beliefs about things, right? Yes. Well, I think that's a legitimate concern uh, to be looking out for, but we're already facing it through social media is this is going to be just yet another way and possibly, you know, a little bit more intense because artificial intelligence also has the ability to read our expressions. Right. Right. So, so right. you can imagine if AI is monitoring your facial expressions as it's interacting with you, and then it can go, "Oh, this guy's not buying it. I better change my tactic." <laughs> right. And yeah. so you can see it. You know, a future in which AI is interacting with you and changing its tactics in real time to try to manipulate you. And again, it's not going to be the machine that's doing this. It's someone who's programmed it to do this. So. Yeah. You know, it's never a fear. We don't have to worry about a future where robots are going to take over the world. You got to worry about who are the people who are programming the AI? What are they up to? What are they doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And us being intentional and aware that this is going, this is happening. Um, mm -hmm. When you're talking about this, I'm thinking about Social Dilemma, that, <laughs> that documentary about uh, social media. And I, I didn't make that connection until you just des described it now that we've, we've created this for ourselves in a way we've allowed a lot of this so that it does circle back to us that yeah, we wanted no, this in yeah, a there's no way. sentience here ai yeah. is it's a mirror to humanity it's <gasps> us looking right into the mirror and the mirror is who ai is it's whoever we want it to be but you know humans sometimes aren't very nice and that that mirror image isn't sometimes very nice either on that note, I'm going to close it right out. That's the last thought you all should walk away with is that it's a mirror to us and to be aware of that. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, really, really fun chatting with you, audience. I hope you enjoyed that. I did. I saw a lot of chatter in the box, so um, there's the creepy. <laughs> um, anyway, Alex, have a great rest of the day. Uh, folks in the audience, uh, you know we'll continue to have more of these quantum conversations. And it's never to end the conversation. It's always to begin and to have more. And enjoy the rest of your day and evening. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Bye. everybody. <laughs>